Good evening, everybody. A very warm welcome to the RSA. My name is Michelle Moore, and we're really, really pleased to see you tonight. Are we in the house? Is everybody here with us? <laughs> oh, we are. Fantastic. I'm delighted to bring to you the Emma Clark event tonight. This has uh, been a dream of mine and Anna's, my co-curator. We are here to celebrate and honour the legacy of Emma Clark, Britain's first black female football pioneer. So a very warm welcome to everybody on the live stream, to those of you who have tuned in globally, to all of those people that are fans of Emma Clark. And we want to kind of honour her memory today. And we've got a really great event lined up for you with performances, young people's input, and a great panel discussion. Um, I do want to kind of just point out that we have a social media hashtag, Honour Emma Clark, and we would love it for you to post to say great things about the night and to do that consciously as well. We are talking about issues to do with race, identity, gender, so please do that sensitively. So we want to kind of kick off really our proceedings by thanking the RSA because this is a very prestigious place. If you just look around you at the surroundings that we're in, we thought that this was really, really fitting to honour Emma. It would never be a place that she would have envisaged where she would actually be as a black woman back in the 1800s. So, tonight is possible because of the FAIR Network. The FAIR Network is a fantastic organisation that funds anti-discriminatory work like this, like tonight, globally, and it's a part of the Football People Weeks. So we're really pleased to be able to bring this to you this evening. As well, tonight wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for a man called Stuart Gibbs, and we're going to be hearing from Stuart a little bit later on. Stuart discovered Emma's story a few years ago, and through his hard work, his unpaid voluntary work, and really finding out about what Emma's life was like, he has been shine, shone a light on her story. And through the Blue Plaque Rebellion, uh, Anna Kessel and her campaigning work was able to light up the story of Emma Clark and bring it to everybody's attention. And the Blue Plaque scheme was actually founded by the RSA in 1850, 1856 as well. So that's a, a really good thing to know too. So just to set the context, we're here because we want to bring everybody into the fold of the Emma Clark story. We want to inspire you to get involved and to hear and to kind of share collaborations and think about what else we can do for the campaign for Emma. But it's also fitting because it is Black History Month. It is the last day of Black History Month. And why is that important? It's important because black history has been denied from British history. And what we want to do is reclaim that and redress that. And by sharing this story, we hope to do some part of that. And today, it's, it's Black History Month. It's not Diversity Month. It's not Inclusion Month. It's Black History Month, people. I just want to make that point. Um, and as we celebrate uh, Emma's story, it's also uh, important to remember that um, in, in Afua Hirsch's book, she talks about identity and, what it, and British history and sometimes the uncomfortable truths that come out. So as we celebrate the story of Emma and the legacy of what she achieved, we have to remember the, the falsehoods of some history that we, we'll be confronted with. So that's enough from me. I hope I've set the scene a little bit. You know what I'm like. We will keep this pacey. We will keep it dynamic. Um, and we want your engagement as well. So on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, please engage with us. And there will be an opportunity for a Q&A session as well. So I'm going to hand over to my co-curator, Anna Kessel. Anna is a campaigner, an acclaimed author, and um, a sports writer and journalist. She's fantastic. She's my co-curator, and she's going to take you through some slides to share a bit more insight into Emma's life. A very warm welcome to Anna Kessel. Thanks, Michelle. And hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, it's amazing to be here celebrating Emma's story that, and to think that it was just a couple of years ago that we, we only ever found out about Emma. Um, I'm going to start with a slide of a painting done by Stuart Gibbs, the artist and historian who discovered Emma. And the reason why I want to share this image with you, not only because it's a lovely image, is because this space is about reimagining Emma's story. 
it's not just about a story that's stuck in the archives with bits of paperwork. This is a space to bring Emma to life. That's what we want to do tonight. We want to share that story through different perspectives, through different lenses. And I think the panel and uh, performances later are going to, going to really do that for us. This is Emma's house. <laughs> she was born in Liverpool in uh, 1875. And she would have lived at, at this house in Bootle with um, her 13 other siblings and her mum and dad, William Clark and Wilhelmina Clark. Uh, William was a, a bargeman in Liverpool, which was a very common job to have then. Um, we think that her heritage, her, her black heritage, comes from her mother's side. But again, that's something that we really want to investigate more. We want to know much, much more about Emma's, Emma's black identity. Um, the wonderful thing about the fact that this house still stands is that it makes it eligible for a plaque. Because, as some of you may know, with the whole blue plaque scheme, it's pretty hard to tick all the criteria to get a plaque. And one of them is that the building has to be entirely existing as it was at the time uh, that it was being inhabited. And this one does. And I think it's, it's wonderful, actually, that it's, it's a really modest home, and you can imagine 14 children trying to, trying to squeeze in there. Um, how did Emma start playing football? Well, when Emma was about six or seven years old, the first official women's football match took place up in Scotland. Um, and that, later that same year, a, a series of women's football matches actually took place in Liverpool. It's unlikely that Emma would have had the money to go and watch them, but she would have likely heard about them. And to think that in your city, women were playing football in 1881, I think is quite a big deal. She also happened to live around the corner from one of the first stars of the women's game, Helen Matthews, whose stage name or football name was um, Mrs. Graham. So it may well be that they had played together. Um, age 15, she was confectioner's assistant, but by the age of 20, she was playing for the British ladies' team. There's Emma in the back row, second from left. Um, I think it's just such a wonderful photo. I love her sort of slightly dreamy expression and just a hint of a smile. I would love to know what she was thinking. Um, again, that's why we're here today, to try and get inside who Emma was as a person. Um, she would have trained for several months through the winter of 1894-95. Um, they were being trained by a Tottenham player, Bill Julian, um, who also plays for Arsenal at the time. So he was the first player to play for both of those North London teams, although at the time Arsenal was a South London team, as Tottenham fans always love to remind us. <laughs> um, they trained through the winter and then debuted on the 23rd of March, 1895, in Crouch End. Um, over 10,000 paying spectators came to watch this match. There was media coverage and Emma was paid to play around a shilling a week, plus food and lodgings. If you think about that today, in 2018, we're still talking about women's football. How do we get media coverage? How do we get thousands of spectators through the gate for domestic league matches? And how do we get women better pay? Well, over 100 years ago, these things were already taking place, which I think is amazing. Um, I'm just going to read you a quote from one of the, <laughs> the reports in the sketch at the time. There was an astonishing sight in the neighbourhood of the Nightingale Lane Ground, Crouch End, on Saturday afternoon. Crouch End itself rubbed its eyes and pinched its arms. The intelligent foreigner might have been excused for imagining some state function was taking place, a drawing room, for example. All through the afternoon, trainloads of excited people journeyed over from all parts, and the respectable array of carriages, cabs, and other vehicles marked a record in the history of football. Yet all that this huge throng of 10,000 had gathered to see was the opening match of the British Ladies Football Club. This picture is important for a number of reasons. One, the fact that there was so much coverage of Emma, and, and the irony then that we lost her story for over 100 years, despite there being the existence in the archives of these reports. But two, I've shown you it because of this depiction of Emma's race, which I think is really important, as obviously one of the main reasons why we're here today. She's also described in a report as the dark, dark fleet-footed girl on the wing. So at the time, she, her race and her identity was important and was noted. And that's another reason that we want to talk about it today. It was noted then and it's notable now. I love this photo. Over on the far right is Emma Clark in action. <laughs> You've also got Mrs. Graham and Nettie Honeyball. Um, again, two, 
personas, not real names. Um, we see very few images in our mainstream media of women playing sport or playing football. They tend to be static images. And so it's really exciting that we have these match play action images from the time. Um, it's also significant that this, this game was played at the home of the Wickham Wanderers, Lokes Park, um, in 1895. And the British ladies team with Emma toured all over the country. They played at St. James's Park in Newcastle. They played at Valley Parade in Bradford. They played at Wembley, the old Wembley, um, and Portman Road in Ipswich. So they were not one-hit wonders. I want to share these pictures with you because there's another part of the narrative related to Liverpool and Emma that's really important. Many of you will know that Liverpool has this intrinsic connection with slavery through its port. But even long after slavery was abolished in Emma's time, there was still this link. The cotton that was being picked and packed by slave hands in America at that time was arriving into the port of Liverpool and retrieved by British workers' hands, then sent to the Lancashire mills. But it wasn't just a trade connection, it was more than that. There was this whole Confederacy identity bound up in Liverpool's history, which is why I've put these, these little insignia from um, buildings in Liverpool that have that Confederate flag and that association. And Liverpool was known as the European HQ of Confederacy. In David Olashoga's book, he talks about how Liverpool was literally up to its neck in slavery, even 50 years after slavery was abolished. And when the Civil War broke out in America and Britain declared neutrality in that war, Liverpool continued to be a site that built war boats that were sent to America to support the South, to keep that cotton trade going. There was that vested interest. And despite all of that, Liverpool had this significant black community, and it was a very mixed community too, um, with black cultures from all over the world, not just the West Indies. This slide is of a board game. It depicts the scramble for Africa and colonialism, which was then translated into British homes as entertainment, <laughs> diversion. Um, around 50 years after slavery was abolished, European nations met in Berlin and literally carved up Africa. You have that bit, I'll take that bit. Britain was proudly announcing to the world, it wrote in the Times, you know, we are the moral beacon, everybody else should follow our lead and abolish slavery too, but at the same time, they were carving up this continent and taking its riches. And back home, they, they transported these stories and there were exhibits in Earl's Court down the road of what we'd now think of as human zoos. Um, peoples from different countries in Africa put on display. And I wondered about that spectacle that spectacle of women's football, women being on display, and that spectacle of black people being on display, and that double bind for Emma, which I think is still significant today when we talk about the double blind bind of women of colour. To bring this story to life now, I would really like to introduce to the stage Tanya Loretta D, who played Emma in the original um, uh, production of the Offside play, which is wonderful. If you haven't seen it, it was written by celebrated poets Sabrina Mafuz and Holly McNish. Um, please give Tanya a huge warm hand. When I put my mind to something, well, we won 3 0. <laughs> I didn't even let one little bugger pass me. And once the last whistle blew, we swarmed to swap embraces laced with sweat and shake the hands of the other team. All of us breath shook, all of us stemming tears. That's when we heard them leering at the sides. Indecently dressed, go home to rest your legs or you won't get fed. We laughed at first, curtsied to be cheeky. What a disgrace, go home and sew some lace. We beamed back our proud faces at them. Then, without us really knowing how, we began to form a cloud of women in the middle of the field. As the thunderous men stormed towards us, angrier than an ocean, and still we smiled. They got nearer 
and we were surrounded on all sides, their neckties flapping around in the breeze. Mrs. Graham shouted at them, look at your faces, redder than ours, and you've just been sitting on your fat asses all day. That was the only dumps they needed. Bringing their knees higher, they got nearer and nearer. Other men were shouting at them to stop. The police will be called. Your wives will be appalled. Pull yourselves together, men. Now, these supportive men finally began to run towards us too. But the rabble had a good few decades of seconds before the new saviours approached. So they tried to grab our bits of unpinned hair, shouting, too weak to play with a ball. I raised my head up tall. I saw the flick of a razor smile on the mouth of one of them, flashing winks to one another as their necks bent down, their backs started to curve, their hands moved towards the pantaloons of the girl I just whooped victory with. Yet I knew what they wished to do. In anger at our daring to wear trousers of sorts, they wanted to pull them off in front of everyone. See how much we didn't care about our fair sex then. Oh, these men, weren't they cunning and sly? Perhaps. But they didn't bet on having me, the footballer from a city steeped in slavery. I took a breath. I pushed the girl next to me, back with my arm, one foot up in the air, then down, spring, jump, up, up, arms out, nimble fingers ready. Their faces turn too late. I bring one hand to each of their waistbands, and with all the force of all the air I've ever breathed, ever flew through, ever felt slap my face, I pulled, pulled, pulled. And as I land hard on my knees, their trousers land just after me. <laughs> Two overweight men standing in a field in their underwear. <laughs> My lips tasted mud. I spat it out, looked up. The crowd were covering their own mouths. They didn't want to let the laughter out, but of course it leaked, impossible to stop. And the angry men retreated, calling names. The women helped me up. Again, we hugged. What a finale to a game. <laughs> Victory! <laughs> Thank you. How amazing, how emotive, how powerful. Thank you so much, Tanya, it was brilliant. So we're gonna get on to our panel now. I'd like to invite our panel to come and take the stage. Please give them a very warm welcome, everybody. So we have a fire panel for you today, people. This panel is seriously talented. It's a joy of mine to do events like this, to, to interview and moderate panel discussions with amazing women. So I'm going to give you just a, a few lines of introduction to everybody, and then we're going to get into our panel discussion. So Emma Dabiri is a teaching fellow, uh, Dabiri, sorry, a teaching fellow in the Africa Department at SOAS, at the School of Oriental and African Studies. She's also an author, a broadcaster, and her first book, Don't Touch My Hair, will be published by Penguin, Penguin in May 2019. A very warm welcome to Emma. <laughs> Charlie Brink Brinkhurst-Cuff is an award-winning writer, editor, and columnist who focuses on issues around race, feminism, social justice, and media. She's the deputy edi editor of Galdem and has just finished making a film with Nike um, and also published a book of essays on the Windrush experience. Charlie. <laughs> and last but by no means least, Eartha Pond, professional football player, recently for Tottenham Hotspur, now not playing, but also a Grenfell campaigner, a former assistant head teacher at a secondary school, a PE teacher. Uh, she used to play for Everton, Reading, QPR, Leeds, Barnet, and Buffalo Flash, and Charlton. Eartha Pond for you, people. <laughs> so, 
So we've heard uh, a bit about Emma's story. We don't know huge amounts because uh, we still need to find that out. So we know a little bit about the context of black women's experience in the late 19th century, but what else could, can you tell us, Emma? Um, and Emma and Emma, this is brilliant. Um, <laughs> what would it have been like for a, a black British woman back in the public eye in the 19th century? Well, first of all, she has a great name. So Doesn't I'm sure she? That, that's going to advantage her. Um, yeah, so it, it's, 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 that's an interesting question. Um, there weren't that many black women or women of colour in the public eye to begin with. Um, she would have the double bind of being from a very working class background um, in a time, this is Victorian society, so it is highly stratified according to class distinctions. Um, I'm assuming that their background is very, w was originally quite materially impoverished because I know that as a confectioner's assistant, um, the confectionery industry, there was a lot of cottage industries and a lot of people actually who worked in confectionery worked in very straightened and quite, quite terrible conditions. Um, so certainly getting, the, uh, getting onto the football team and um, getting the lodgings and the salary that she was earning would have been like kind of a huge yeah. step up the social ladder. But um, as kind of was painted so compellingly in the, in the, opening, um, in the opening speech, this is Britain possibly at, at one of its, mo oh, it has so many racist moments, but at one <laughs> of its like <laughs> particularly racist moments. Um, this is the era, the, the era of um, colonization. Um, it's the era of scientific racism. About 10 years before Emma was born, we really start to see the solid... So there, there's been racism and prejudice towards black people for centuries, obviously Britain being so implicated in the slave trade. But it's in around the 1860s, so Emma's born in 1875, that we really see the entrenchment of scientific racism and the idea that you can empirically and scientifically prove that black people are actually a, dif a different species. So she's not born at the, at the best time. She is in Liverpool, and Liverp Liverpool has a, f a fascinating history, and the, the Liverpool-born the Liverpool black identity is, it, is a really distinctive black British identity. First of all, it like massively predates what, we, what the kind of common narrative is that there is any significant black British population kind of post Windrush. The Liverpool um, black community starts in the 1700s with um, American loyalists who um, fought, on, fought on the side of the crown and then emigrated to the, to the, to the UK, to Liverpool. And then its numbers are added to by West Africans, by people from, uh, people from the Caribbean and other parts of Africa. And as, uh, as was said, it was a very mixed community because most of the uh, black people that came to Britain were male. So they tended to have children with white women. Yeah. And then a lot of the women that we see, um, black British women that we see are actually of, of mixed race, um, such as Emma. Uh, so yeah, it's a very, she's from a supportive, com not supportive community, but a distinctive black community. Fascinating answer. Sorry, that was a, a very yeah, long no, answer. Okay. <laughs> it kind of, kind of really sets the scene for us and, and the context of thinking about Emma's story today, Charlie, in your, in your world, it, I, that kind of whole, um, you know, deletion of, of black women's stories from history. I, I mean, and even from contemporary narratives, I, I'm assuming that's something that you're, you, you know a lot about through your kind of work as deputy editor of Gowden. Can you yeah. share some of your experiences? Yeah, I suppose it's one of those things that we are constantly thinking about on like uh, a day-to-day -day basis at Gowden. Um, one of the reasons why we sort of kind of didn't actively um, do anything particularly special for Black History Month this year is because we celebrate black history every day on the site. Um, but I had a really interesting conversation with um, Zing um, from Broadly, um, and she, she's a journalist and she's just published a, a series of books called Forgotten Women. And she, she put it to me in a really like beautiful way about how women's stories, like she kind of almost challenged the, 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 the title of her, of her text. She was saying, it's not that, um, it's not that they're just forgotten, it's like that they're continually forgotten. So there's no, sus there's no sustainability in, in black women's stories, women of color stories, narratives, um, which is why I hope that this campaign, you know, you know it has the plaque, it, it, it kind of rolls on, it doesn't get forgotten again. And so in your work, how do you make women of color more visible? 
I suppose we do it, we do it in all the practical ways. We do it by, um, by sort of highlighting their stories. We do it by publishing articles. We do it by having conversations, events like these. Um, there's no sort of magical solution to sort of like, you know, you do this and then like suddenly black women are, are going to be everywhere. But like there are small things that we can do every day and that we do do every day. Um, and, you know, as we see with us sort of infiltrating the mainstream media as we did with our sort of Guardian takeover recently. Um, yep, the, these yeah. <laughs> did anybody buy that, people? <laughs> yes? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it does work. And, and then suddenly you have, um, you know, even, even my, my mum and auntie stories, which I was able to write about for, for the takeover, um, yeah. uh, sort of in the public eye. So. Yeah. And so, Ertha, current footballer, just having a break at the moment. At some point you'll be back on the pitch, I know you will. Um, what did it mean to you to have a black female role model when you were growing up and, and even today? What's the impact of, of having a, a role model who, who, who looks like you? Um, for me, in particular, where I live, I was lucky enough to grow up around Rachel Yankee's era. So she actually went to school with my sister. Um, so I was able to, to know her story. Um, even though it came about a, a kind of weird way because my sister came back from secondary school when she was like, there was this boy in PE in the changing room and we was like, miss, why is he getting changed in here? Because anyone who knows Rachel Yank she shaved the sides of her hair and she used to play with the boys and pretend she was a boy. So it's almost like my sister came back and said, there's someone doing something that you want to do, which is actually quite weird playing football, but actually there are people out there doing it. So for me, it was trying to seek that person who was doing something similar that I, was, I wanted to do. Um, and then seeing people like Rachel was the first professional footballer in the UK and she was black, it kind of inspired me to say, actually, my dream of playing for Man United behind Ryan Giggs could be a reality, <laughs> um, even though it, it, it would never happen. But it, it kind of gave me something to aspire to be and knowing that there was someone who I couldn't look up to there was also going to be people behind me who could look, look up to me as a, an inspiration. So it was about, yes, there's someone who's got their foot already in the door, but I've now got to make sure that I can either match that or emulate that or go further for then the next person behind me to be able to overtake me. So I was quite aware that I had a role to play. If I was really going to do it, I need to make sure I'm going to do it properly because there's going to be people watching, and not just girls and, boy, and boys as well. Um, especially in the era I grew up with, it's hard to find role models. So sport was always a key thing that got our community, community together. So I knew um, I had a major role to play within my community. And, and that's really important, isn't it? It's that the responsibility of being a role model. And why do you think it's important to share Emma's story today? I think similar to what was said before, that the foundation has to be laid in regards to we have to know our history in order to move forward. So unless we have something that's concrete and a foundation that's stable where we can say this happened during this period and this is how we progress, if we keep sort of moving the bar upwards, we're never able gonna be able to have that foundation and to keep building on it um, to create excellence, really. Great. And so we talked, you just, Emma, when we started, we talked a little bit about Emma Clark being of mixed heritage. Um, and how significant that was in the late 19th century in terms of what Liverpool and the interracial marriages. Can you kind of give us your reflection on, on mixed race identity and how that interacts with blackness? Oh, yeah, sure. So the, the Liverpool-born black identity, they identify as, as, as black, but um, they are of mixed heritage. Um, most black... Oh, my, kind of, my, my, my voice is getting louder. I no, it's all good. Okay. Everyone can hear Emma, can't they? It's it seems like it's getting louder and louder. Mm -hmm. Everybody, cool. Um, so if you look at, like, most diasporic black populations, so the black population in America, the black population in the Caribbean, they are multiracial. They have other ancestry as well. They don't necessarily, but they identify as black, and they are identified as black. Um, so that's one thing. But in terms of Emma specifically being mixed, um, I don't know how she would... Have, view, have viewed herself. I don't know if she would have seen herself as black, if she would have seen herself as something different to that. I know with Mary Seacole, who always kind of tops lists as one of the most kind of important uh, figures of, in black British history, um, I read her, I read an account of hers where she, she actually she doesn't identify as black. Um, and I believe that her mother was mixed and her father was white. So she's of probably more white ancestry than black. 
So mixed race isn't like a historically um, consistent identity. There are people who, have mi who are of mixed parentage that in one era or in one location would identify as black and in another would identify very strongly as, as mixed. Um, in, kind of contempor in the contemporary time, mixed race has only been on the census, I think since 2001, and you've only had the opportunity to go into more detail as to what mixed race you're even talking about since 2011. So uh, for a long time, people that were mixed were classified as black. Um, and it still is kind of like an ideological decision that, mm. that, that one makes. I mean, it can be imposed on you as well, but you, it's also a decision that people make. Of course, and, and it was interesting when we saw the slide uh, of the, the picture where Emma's face is shaded in. So that, that's, that's very telling to me, because if you actually look at the photographs of her, she is not hugely distinct in skin shade from the white women. But when you look at imaginings and drawings of her, they make her look like they make her look very black. So certainly in the public imagination, it seems as though she is being perceived as a black woman, regardless of how much black ancestry she has or of how she identifies herself. Mm -hmm. And as a as a black woman, she would have been under kind of physical threat at that time, being a, as a as a sportswoman. How, what do you think? How do you think that kind of played itself out? She was on, under physical threat. I mean, I mean, some of the histories it talks about, um, you know, even in what Tanya kind of showed us today, it talks about the kind of uh, hostility that women would have had to face in terms of, you know, yeah. taking part in their sport. Um, and even this idea of creating these personas is that, you know, they had to p portray themselves as kind of genteel and yeah, this, this idea of proper ladies as such. And I, I, for her as a woman of colour, would, would, would that kind of, what were yeah, your reflections? As a woman of colour, she was, as a working class woman of colour, she was probably excluded from being a respectable person anyway. Um, but I would imagine that, yeah, that was certainly an additional, um, an additional kind, of, additional kind of stigma that she would have faced. And I'm sure it was something that was communicated to her during football matches. I'm sure there was... Yeah. A level of abuse. Yeah. I can't imagine that there, there wouldn't have been. Yeah. Um, I've read accounts of um, people who are not even um, sports people, but just um, Africans who were visiting England at that time. I think it's also interesting to, um, to remember that not all the black people in the UK at that time are working class. There's a lot of um, rich Africans who visit, and often they have to stay and have children, or they don't, they don't necessarily stay, but they sometimes have children. Um, with middle-class women, I'm thinking of a performer called Evelyn Dove, who comprised this kind of uh, mixed race. Uh, they're mixed race, or they're, they're black, and they're middle class. Um, but yeah, there are accounts of kind of, these, there's a middle-class African guy, I'm thinking of ABC Merryman, Labour Merryman, and he talks about walking the streets of London, maybe about 20 years, 10 years after Emma's birth, and the level of racist abuse that he receives, especially in working class areas. So yeah, I wouldn't imagine it was easy. And, and Charlie, just um, kind of thinking about today um, um, and what you've just been up to. You've kind of just finished making a film with Nike, um, capturing your story of playing football. And can you tell us a bit about that, you know, as a football player, but, and how that experience links with, with Emma's story? Yeah. So um, I first started playing football when I was eight years old um, and I was sort of, I was born in Hackney um, and it was in the playground and the boys were playing and they said I couldn't play and I was like, well, I'm going to play then. Um, and so I started, they let me be in goals, um, but I didn't want to be in goals because I was very fast. Um, but then I moved up to Scotland when I was, um, when I was nine and I think I, I played sort of like from then and, until my sort of early teens. Um, but I think it's that classic thing for young women t today, um, and it's sort of reflected in statistics as well, is that there's a big drop-off when young women hit their teens. Um, and for me, that was also compounded with racism that I received on the pitch, because it was the first time in my life, um, I think, that I can remember at least, where I, I dealt with overt racism was on, was on the, the sort of, you know, playing fields, playing, race, uh, playing football even. Um, 
didn't get the racial slurs right, but you know, it was still, it was still, it right? yeah, as in like, oh, you know, okay. the P word, word instead of the N word, but yeah, oh. anyway. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then when I got to uni when I was 17, I moved back down to London. I was like, I'm going to start playing again. And then since then, I've like, I've played and it's been brilliant. And the sort of the, the amateur women's teams um, in London have always been such a beautiful safe space for me and like super diverse. And, and I've just, I've had the best time. So anyway. Fast forward, Nike asked me if I'd be up for doing this documentary. Um, oh, as they do. As they do, okay. yeah. Um, and it was basically sort of follow, following my story with the, on the basis of like encouraging more young women to sort of get into sport. Um, and like while, while I was doing it, I obviously started reading more about Emma and it was, it was yeah, I'd, I'd read her story a few years ago, but because I was in this process of like training and like actually becoming probably not as good as you, but a bit better at football, <laughs> um, um, it was so gratifying to read about someone who I felt I had this connection with through the ages and, and, and you know, she, she feels like, you know, like my predecessor in a way. Um, yeah, so that was really, really cool. Um, and then also when I, when I was sort of doing the documentary, there were some really interest, interesting stats came out which um, found that um, black and Asian women um, are the least likely to be involved in um, sort of recreational sports. Um, like you know past their teens or whatever um and that was another motivation for me being like this is definitely a good thing because i would encourage everyone every woman in this room who hasn't tried football yet to give it a go like it's it's hard and it's beautiful and for someone like me who suffers from anxiety it's you know it's stressful but it's um it's it's been such a, a wonderful experience and yeah i love it yeah thank you for <laughs> sharing that that with us we really appreciate that So when, do, when does the film come out? Can we come? Is there a premiere? I love, I love a red carpet. <laughs> yeah, God, I wish. You know um, it's actually already out now. So oh, it's it on, it's, it's a, there's this new thing called IGTV, which is like Instagram TV. Oh, I'm a little bit old. <laughs> so say that again. <laughs> IGTV. IGTV. So like, if you go on your Instagram, you'll notice a new button. And if you press on the button, you can sort of search for it. Um, it's called uh, Power Women, I think. Power yeah. Women. Power Women. Yeah. Okay. So gonna TV have, ha it has shows on it, has yeah, programs yeah, on it. Yeah. Oh, I haven't clicked on the it's button good. yet. Yeah, no, no, okay, I'm like, okay on, let's, let's stay on track, guys. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know what I'm like? Right. Um, Eartha. So, there are no known um, interviews with Emma, so we can only guess, and we kind of heard a little bit from Emma D tonight. Sorry, I need to do that in my head. Um, at the kinds of discrimination and racism that, that Emma Clark would have received on, on pitch as a footballer. Um, what have been your experience of that within the game? Um, and and, and kind of can you share with us some of your reflections? Um, I think as a sort of starting point, um, it's, it's really important that you understand the context where I've come from. So I've come from an area where statistically it's, it's deprived. Um, and I think it's, it's sort of given me that mindset that the, I have to work that little bit harder. Um, and the bar is always going to be raised. So for me, I've never really stopped and thought about discrimination as a thing because I've always been sort of below the line. So I've always known I, I have to fight that a little bit harder. Um, but now I've stopped and reflected on it. Um, and ever since sort of the Eniola and Leanne Sanderson thing that's come up, I've actually thought these are things that I've dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I think education, not just in school academically, I think environment and households have a major part to play in educating people. And I think any being in the field that she is in regards to law, she knows about what are definitions of discrimination and what it actually looks like. Um, and that's not really been something that I've spent any time to, to look and research. But actually now when I'm watching the play unfold, I'm like, these are things that I've dealt with day to day. And actually these are, I've actually been discriminated against. Um, Am I going to bring a case against it? No. Um, I'm, I'm the sort of person who sees things as half full rather than half empty. Um, so, yes, I have most probably experienced discrimination, but I think due to my sort of mindset and my, um, my upbringing, it's almost like, okay, if they say this is what I need to do, that's what I need to achieve. If they say I need to do something differently to somebody else, um, I don't really think, is it because I'm black? I'm like, that's the target. I'm going to get to that target and I'm going to achieve my goal and I've done that within football, I've done that in education, I've done that within politics. Um, so I don't really use it as an excuse. 
Um, but if you look at the sort of legalities and statutory definitions of it, yes, I have had discrimination, um, but I've not let it affect me. So I haven't really noticed it in regards to the way that I play. And thanks for sharing that with us, because that, that's really important. There's also the context of the massive underrepresentation of women of colour within the administration and the governance of sports mm -hmm. and wider society. But how, and, and within coaching, the backroom staff, and on the field of play. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you think that impacts on the young generation coming up? And, and how has that impacted upon you? Um, I think where we need to look at it is that it's a humanitarian issue. I think that we need to make sure that we are challenging policy makers. I think we need to be put our foot in those doors to be around those conversations for change to happen. Um, so when we're looking at how do we change that representation, we have to have people who they can physically see. So you have people like Danielle Carter, who's on boards now. We have people like Alex Scott that are in media. But that's just sort of drops. So they're dropping the ocean. So it's about how can we have more coverage. Um, but it's not about putting them there because we want to match a narrative. People have to be talented enough to be there. And there are people out there who are talented to hold those positions. So it's about us uh, raising those questions um, and ensuring that we have opportunity and access for people to be able to be successful in those careers um, that are sometimes thought of not interested or people that of colour don't want to be um, in those positions. So it's about knowing that actually if it is something that you really are interested in, that there are support networks, because there are places and, and areas, especially I'm t I can only talk for London from where I've grown up um, from, there are um, poverty lines and things such as, am I going to send my child to do sports um, instead of putting the light or gas on? Am I going to buy that sports bra for £38? It's not a priority. Um, and these are the things that we need to be understand that people do need support. Um, and we're not just talking about uh, people that have come from poor backgrounds. These are working class people that are, who are still living under the poverty line where parents are working two, three jobs and still can't meet the needs and demands of what their children need or require. Um, so it's about how do we make sure that we are supporting them and having systems in place to help them um, get to where they want to, but also how do we use our positions to challenge policy to ensure that people are not living in those sort of conditions because we're in 2018 and we shouldn't have to be dealing with that. Great, great points, really well made. I should have mentioned that you're a councillor and your uh, so politics does does form a part of the, some of your answers as, as rightfully it should. So, just kind of um, kind of just bringing it back round really to, to Emma's story and what we've heard um, in terms of what it was like for her, 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 you know, the fact that she was only one of five that survived into adulthood. When we put it into that kind of context, what? What does, she, what does she say to you? What, what would be your message to Emma if she was around today? I mean, we're trying to reimagine with quite a scant information, really, Emma's life. And we really want people to be inspired to, to go out and find funded opportunities for research and, and to get more of this information out there around Emma, out in the public eye. But what, what would you say to Emma, Emma D? <laughs> what would you know what would be your reflections what are your reflections about it when when we first approached you about it you were really excited and that was fantastic but yeah we use this space to kind of tell us a little bit about your reflections yeah I'm 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 just I'm really passionate about the presence of black people and black women um, in Britain historically and um, in historical periods where we are kind of, well, yeah, we're told that there weren't really any black people. And I think it's, um, Charlie, I think you were saying you see her as your um, predecessor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> maybe, a bit, maybe a bit much, but yeah. No, 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 <laughs> that, 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 re that, really, that really resonated because um, as, as black people in this country, um, you can be told, you, you know, the sense that you don't really belong, you're kind of a, a recent a recent migrant that there's no that, that there's no kind of history as it were so figures like Emma kind of create this trajectory where young women today can see that they did have like a predecessor kind of a hundred years ago or 150 years ago and I think that's I think that's really important to have that context and we have some young people with us today as well we're going to be hearing their voices later on so that's brilliant 
Charlie, your reflection. What would you say to Emma? What do you think? What's God, your emotions around it? I wouldn't say anything. I'd just listen to her, I think. I, I think as a journalist, I just wouldn't be like, can I interview you? Is that OK? <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I mean, I think, yeah, following on from what Emma was saying, um, with this book that I've been working on, on the Windrush generation, obviously is now seen as this period where the you know, first mass immigration of black people into the country, blah, blah. But one of the things I was really keen to do with the book was to make sure that it wasn't looked at you know, it's a marker to look backwards and forwards, not just like, this is where black history began. Um, just because I do pay attention to what people like you and David say. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think with Emma, I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, w I want to know more. I really hope that historians like Stuart keep working hard. <laughs> Stuart, where are you? <laughs> keep working hard. Um, <laughs> um, just so people like me can, can report on it and, and develop her, her story and put it on Galadem and put it in The Guardian and, yeah, get it out there. Yeah, yeah that's what I'd like to do. Uh -huh. I think I'd summarise her as total black girl magic um, oh, right. in one sentence, but I think it's really important that we recognise her excellence as a footballer, not just a she female footballer yeah. or a black footballer, mm. as a footballer. And I think sometimes we sort of downplay um, excellence because of those sort of boundaries or titles. Um, and I think we just need to recognise how good she actually was. Um, she was a great technician. She was a great yeah. technician, yeah. yeah. And anyone that can play in goal and on pitch, similar to myself, must be excellent. <laughs> Must be excellent. So must be. Um, must be. Must be. Um, yeah. So yeah. So she she travelled again from in Liverpool to London to Scotland, and if if we're talking about the sort of insults and stuff she would have faced just in Liverpool, to still think that actually I'm going to travel across the country and still expect this sort of abuse, um, and I don't actually care, um, says something about her, and she's almost got this mentality of don't tell me, show me and she's almost going to do it. So you have to respect her craft. And when she steps on that pitch, she, she demonstrates what she's all about. So, yeah. Oh, fantastic. And I just wanted to kind of just speak to you a little bit about your work as a campaigner for Grenfell. I mean, um, back in, in, the 18, in, in 1895, when Emma was playing, when she made her debut at Crouch End, football was seen as a bit of a spectacle then. Um, and, you know, a um, hundred years later, black and brown, white working class people that, that perished in Grenfell um, were treated similarly, really, in the sense that they were forgotten about, that they um, had rolling media coverage, minute by minute, um, and you know, disturbingly so. So I, I just, I did, I wanted to ask about why did you decide to to campaign for, for Grenfell? You know, you're a professional footballer. You, you, you're an educationalist. It's not like you have a lot of spare time. Um, but what was it that, that motivated you to get involved? It's, it's my community. Um, and that's something that r means quite a lot to me. And it's not about having spare time. It's about making time for things that are important. Um, and what happened down at Grenfell, I think, is more of a humanity issue um, more than anything. And I think it sort of reminds us what is important. Um, and for me, it, it was a no-brainer. It, it was my community under threat, once again, not being listened to. And I think that's the bit that's most disappointing, as, as we see with the coverage. It's not something that was new. It's stuff that they'd been saying and complaining. And it's about, this is what neglect gets us. And it's ensuring that everyone's voice is heard and I think this is sort of what's inspired me to be a counsellor, to be a footballer, to be a teacher, not necessarily because I want to but because I need to. Um, I'm very clear that we need to have role models and we need to have people that again are challenging policies and being around those tables to have those conversations for the people who can't, who don't have a voice um, and that's something that we've seen in Grenfell, but it's stuff that's happened with Hillsborough and other things that have been going on for years. So, again, it, I don't think it's anything that's going to stop anytime soon. Um, but I'm just another voice who's sort of knocking on that door to say this is wrong. Um, and until we sort of start listening, it, it's going to keep happening, unfortunately. And it's about how do we ensure that we get justice. And I think through the positions that I have, not just in regards to 
um, sort of football inside, but in regards to counselling and um, education, it's how can I use that voice and that platform to say, guys, this is going on. And I, I, I just one just thing I'll touch on is when I went to um, Dubai in March for the Global Teacher Prize, where I was one of the top 50 out of 34,000, I actually wow. done my presentation on Grenfell. Yeah. So yeah, so I've done my presentation on Grenfell and I think it's really important that we understand that education, again, I'll say again, is not just academic. It comes from the home, it comes from our community, it comes from being in a sports team because that's taught me loads. It's allowed me to travel across the country. Um, again, sometimes as the only person of colour, I remember going to college at Arsenal Academy at the age of 16, leaving home um, and going to St Albans where there wasn't a lot of black people. Um, and one of the, there wasn't, I don't think there was any... And I arrived there and there was a girl who also joined the academy and she phoned home straight away to say, Black Bertha comes here as well. She didn't even know my name, but she was like, <laughs> that player that we'd played at a Centre of Excellence tournament, she was like, oh my gosh, she's here as well. And one of my teammates, she was like, you're the second black person I've ever seen, apart from this one kid called Anthony who joined our village in Barnstable. And it was like, for her, it was just like amazing experience. And yeah, just sort of getting over those perceptions. So yeah, it's about how do we ensure community cohesion? How can we use the voice and the platform that we have um, in order to have humanity and justice? Thank you. Uh, Emma D, really quickly. Yeah, just to add very quickly, I don't think Emma Clark should be seen like as, um, as an anomaly in that British history is um, imag imagined and constructed as far whiter than it is. There are loads of these black histories out there. And often the research has even been done. It's just not been popularized. But really, please, like I would urge you to, the internet, is, it's, it's as simple as that. There's a lot of the information is there. Um, just go and do a little, bit of, a, a little bit of research yourself and try and familiarize yourself with some of these people. Honestly, the history is full of black characters. Thank you. And what a fabulous panel this has been, isn't it? <laughs> Well done. Thank you. Charlie, thank you. Thank you. And so we are on time and we are going to open it up now for you guys to have an opportunity to ask some questions. I think there are some roaming mics around and we're going to have a bit of a Q&A here. We might take a couple at a time. So don't all rush at once, but... <laughs> Who would like to ask our fabulous panel, who are great role models themselves, uh, any questions? So we have one over here, we have one over here, so we'll start over here. The young person, young girl. Um, what, you oh. like? testing, testing. Um, what do you think needs to be done to get black women into all areas of football and where do we start? Great question. Let's... So what we'll do is we'll take two questions and then we'll come back and we'll answer them. And there are some people in the room that also might be challenged to answer those questions. You know when I'm in charge, I'll use a bit of my chair's prerogative. Chris. In a way, it's a similar question. Do you have a hypothesis as to why women's football, visible women's football, the Lionesses, is so much whiter than men's football at the moment? OK, so shall we start? What, are you looking nervous, Hertha? <laughs> no, great. Should we start with the... They're kind of connected. Visibility, lionesses. What can we do to get women in positions of power, women of colour in football? OK, Ever. so I think, obviously, there needs to be sort of programmes and opportunities which encourage women and girls, and I think we need to start it maybe from a younger age group. So instead of looking at sort of our 16 plus, how do we start going into schools, maybe from primary schools, getting some programs to getting them refereeing, enjoying the game outside of a sort of structured way. So how can they love the different aspects and understand that there are different roles, not just being a footballer. Um, and I think sometimes we see that even with the boys, they just want to be that superstar rather than knowing actually there are many other roles that you can play within the game of football and to be successful. Um, on to the second question. Charlie, or just Charlie, go. Yeah, you got any? Um, I guess I can only speak about it from an amateur perspective. Um, funnily enough, my experience of amateur football, it, it has been really diverse, which I think is a really positive thing. Um, but 
they they all start really late. So it's it's again it's like it's like women build up the confidence later in life to like, and especially black women maybe to start playing, but it doesn't necessarily come from a young age. And I definitely know that what would have supported me with my sort of early ambitions maybe to become a professional footballer, which obviously didn't work out sadly, um, <laughs> would have been um, support both off and on the pitch. So you know when I was getting racist abuse, there wasn't anyone there to to tell me that it was going to be okay or to even reprimand the the, the people who were who were saying the horrible things. So I'm hopefully that has changed, but um, yeah, I'm, I wouldn't be so certain. Yeah. Emma, did you have anything? Full disclosure, I know nothing about football and I'm not even a fan. <laughs> <laughs> so no. <laughs> uh, how would you answer Chris's question around the visibility on, on pitch Linus's? It's something that I've sort of found quite weird with men and women's football as in the youth set of, of boys is there's loads of people of color um in sort of from under 10s all the way through and i don't see that transition into first teams and it's a question that i've always asked why is the youth team so successful and there's so many black players but then when it comes to handing out contracts they don't seem to make the first team what is what is stopping them from getting there and i think in regards to women um a similar thing is it really something that they're interested in, are we really encouraging girls of colour um, at a lower level? I'm, I'm speaking from education because I'm from a teacher as well and it's something that I've struggled with. I see, as Charlie um, sort of mentioned, there's a drop off around about year eight or year nine and sport isn't really cool. Um, so something I'm quite keen about as well is how can we start making sports bras a, a key aspect of a school uniform? Because we have boys have rugby kits and all this sorts of stuff. But girls don't have or are encouraged to wear sports bras. And in regards to well-being and consciousness, they seem to drop off round about year eight and year nine, and they don't really want to play anymore. And that's a major factor because they don't have um, a correct sports bra. And again, we're looking about poverty and sports bras. Am I going to give you £38 to buy a sports bra or am I going to buy shopping? Um, and parents are just not going to... They just don't see football or sport in general as something that's viable um, to, to spend money on. So that transition into a sort of older age group doesn't really happen. And unless they really love sport like I do and really passionate about it, even if they didn't have a sports bra, I'd still play. But some girls right now, there are so many other options to them and they're not really that passionate at all, sort of encouraged to, to sort of follow it through. They sort of drop off. Um, so get girls wearing sports bras, um, so that they can actually think about just playing and not about is somebody watching me or are things bouncing around and and I and I can say this from a, from a pers I can say from a personal experience because actually this could have actually stopped because I remember when I played for Charlton at the time um, my manager I was starting every week first in football highest level when it came to sort of international side I was never selected and my manager sort of questioned the the FA and people at the FA and said, how come she's not being selected when she's playing week in, week out? And actually the girl, uh, another teammate who played for the same team as us, who, who never played, actually was playing at international level. So why was she playing internationally and I wasn't? And I was playing at club level every week, but she wasn't. So they said, I just don't look like a footballer. I just don't match what they perceive as a footballer. So these are things that, that stuck in my mind. And even though I got that feedback, I couldn't change being black. I couldn't, I couldn't wash it off. So I just had to continue being great, continue working hard and doing what I do. If I get an international corn up, I get one. If I don't, I'm still going to enjoy what I do because that's what I've been doing since I was young. So again, it's, it's these sort of boundaries and those sort of conversations. And from a personal view, are those parents there from a black background that are going to be questioning, challenging those people of authority to say, why is my child not playing where I know... Sorry to interrupt you. That they shouldn't have to be in that position to have to make those actual arguments. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is if we were in a system which wasn't uh, systemically racist or mm -hmm. inherently sexist, then we would be in a position where talent shone through, and um, where the the best talent mm -hmm. that was is being identified is able to get through onto the onto the pitch at the highest level. I know that you were described as one as one of the best players that never got. Um, pick to, to represent your country. So that, that, that's correct, but I think, and again, luckily now, the beauty about it is there is more media coverage, so 
the, the questions will be asked now. If that player is performing every week, why are they not getting that international call-up? And we see it in the men's game. So I do welcome more coverage yeah. on women's women's. Football. Interestingly, though, yeah. the sports media, we can talk forever about this. Yeah. The sports media, we don't have many women of colour representative mm -hmm. as, as journalists. So that affects our media as well. Mm -hmm. Emma D? Just very quickly, um, Eartha's comment when she was told she didn't look like a footballer just made me think, what do black people look like? Because the amount of times I've been told that I don't look like a historian or I don't look like a sociologist. And I'm like, what, what, what do we look like? <laughs> like <what? laughs> can I, can I just of course, <laughs> um, No, it, just, it really got me thinking because I'd say one of the, the main reasons why I stopped beyond like, the fact that it wasn't cool anymore when I sort of hit my teens was definitely this idea that playing football was a masculine thing. And I was already so paranoid about the way my, my body looked because, you know, in part because of my blackness, because I had a big bum, because I had big boobs. I was like, absolutely not. I do not want to sort of do anything else that is going to sort of um, make me seem any less feminine. So I was like, okay, no, no sports. I used to like avoid like picking up heavy bags and all this kind of stuff because I didn't want my like any muscles to grow. Like it's ridiculous. Like there's so much pressure on black women when it comes to desirability, when it comes to body image. Um, it doesn't surprise me that much. It wouldn't surprise me that much if that tied into a lot of the reasons why young black women stop playing football. Thank you. Uh, I am conscious that we have time for Q&A. Any more questions? Right here, Ebony Rainford-Brent in the audience. We have the Britain's first black female cricketer with us t today. So we are very, very happy. Hi, Rachel. Yeah, this I wasn't about. expecting a build up. Th hello, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Um, my question actually is just because, you know, seeing this moment cement cemented is, is massive. Um, and I know how important it has been in cricket for me being the first black female, but to see how far this goes back is fascinating. My question, maybe specifically to, I'm going to throw it to Michelle and Emma and possibly yourself as well, Charlie, is uh, how does this story get leveraged? As in, it's great that we're all here tonight. We're most really all going to take it away. Might talk to a few people, but how does this get leveraged? I think there's an opportunity because football's growing so fast. Women's football in particular is on a kind of a curve that we've never seen before, but how can this moment be leveraged? How can we share this? And I'm, I'm looking at you guys because you might have seen stories from the past that no one knew about come to the fore. How does this happen? Um, I, I would say, it, it, you know, it, it is literally through events like this. You see the cameras here. I'm sure there's a few journalists in the room. Um, it's kicking up a fuss. Um, these guys have done Women's Hour. We've all contributed to an article in The Telegraph. I'm certainly going to write about Emma. Um, and yeah, I guess more generally, it's really interesting actually like seeing what's happening with women's football at the moment and um, the fact that obviously I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the first season where all of the people, all of the players in the, um, all the, of the teams in the top tier of women's football are now professional, is that right? Yeah. Um, and we've got the Women's World Cup coming up next year. Um, brands are latching onto it, which is incredibly important, sadly, because it means that, I say sadly because I'm like, anti-capitalism, but, um, <laughs> but in a, in a, it's a good thing in a way because it means there's going to be money behind it. I know like, for a fact that there's like, a lot of sports brands who are definitely going to be doing a lot of campaigning around um, the Women's World Cup. Um, I think the trajectory is only upwards. Like, I'm really optimistic about it, personally. Yeah. Sorry, I'm the voice of doom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think there are often kind of like peaks in interest um, in certain characters and then they often become forgotten again. And I actually don't know how to overcome that. Um, I have a young son and this was the first year that he was in school and had Black History Month. I was horrified by what he was being taught. He was taught about um, Nelson Mandela and Rosa Parks. I'm like, that is just furthering the narrative that there are no black British people. These kind of figures should be taught in, in schools. They should be integrated into mainstream history. So I think we have to kind of push for, for, that, for that to be happening. Did you want to say something? Um, I'll just say, obviously, there, there's the hashtags that we can sort of flood the sort of social medias um, with. And just sort of touching back on what Charlie said, there is also another hashtag which is called What If Campaign. So what if we can ensure that Emma goes into um, some sort of literature, we get the blue plaque, we make loads of noise. Um, I know that Lewis football, women's football team have, have done an amazing campaign where now their men get paid the same as their women's team. Um, so if they can do it, I'm sure Emma can do it. Well, it's a bit of a call to action as well. We, we are doing this as passionate activists, myself and Anna Kessel, to say, right, in our sphere of influence, what can we do to highlight Emma's story? So let's put on an amazing event 
to ignite the inspiration and the excitement, bless you, to everybody, <laughs> to everybody about her story. Because actually, things change because people make choices. You know, inclusion and diversity, equality, is about change that is irresistible to you. So if you have been touched or inspired, and hopefully these young people have been inspired, they, they were the first people to ask a brilliant question tonight, then actually do something about it. Use your influence, use your hashtags. M don't leave this to International Women's Day or Black History Month. Make sure that you go and have a conversation with somebody else. We want to get a statue of Emma Clark. We want, it to be, she, we want her to be immortalized. So this will be a part of a bigger campaign. This is the stuff that's in my closing remarks, so you, you're making me say some stuff now. But I, we definitely want to start a fire around this. And yes, it will be challenging. But we're doing our bit, and we want to bring everybody into that as a collective shared responsibility. So now I have to hand back to, to Anna, who's going to just say a few words. But a very thank you very much for your questions and your answers, and thank you to our panel. an amazing panel discussion and prompting so many ideas around representation, role models, visibility, legacy. Thank you for that question, Ebony. That was really important. Um, this live stream that's been taking place now comes to a close. Thank you to everyone who joined us and a huge thank you to RSA for hosting us and to FAIR for funding us. Thankfully, it's not the end of the event. We're going to keep going because there's so many other bits that we want to bring you. And we'd like to welcome Stuart Gibbs, please, to the stage. Um, we think there's questions that some of you in the audience may like to ask him. Please join us. Without you, none of this would be possible. So we're really thankful that you've come all the way from...